Good morning. Uh, I thought maybe, uh, since I have so many people asking me uh, how my mom is doing, I thought I'd just give you all an update. Um, you know, I, if you didn't know, uh, she moved in with Michelle and I about two months ago, and a month ago, uh, she fell at our house and broke her hip. She's 93 years old, so she's been in rehab, uh, and she's been improving uh, amazingly. Uh, thank you, Father, for that. And yesterday, we were able to bring her home for a four-hour stay. So... Uh, but, you know, I, when, when I talked to her before she moved in with us, I said, Mom, you know, you might want to think about moving in with us. You know, you'll be safer here. And uh, <laughs> But the good part is her short-term memory is so bad. That the other day I said to her, I said, Mom, you know, if you'd have moved in with us, this probably wouldn't have happened. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's like, you know, just like anything else, she goes, no, I, I know where this happened at, so. <laughs> but we're just praising God that, uh, you know, at 93, she is working her tail off, and she's getting better, and the occupational and the physical therapists are really amazed at how well she's doing. So I know that's due to many of your prayers. So thank you. Keep, keep that up. <clears throat> so are you tired of hearing all these things in this series that I've been bringing you, uh, Vitality in the Body of Christ? I, I hope you're not. Uh, because these sermons are intended to enhance our faith and encourage us in our walk, our walk individually, and then our walk corporately also as the body. And I pray that we never get tired of hearing how we can be enthused and how we can carry out this work for our Lord in a greater way. You know, as I said previously, all these elements that I've been preaching about in this series, every one of them have the potential to bring with them an energy that will strengthen and embolden the church, enabling us to further bring about God's kingdom on earth, which is what we're called to do. However, each one of these come with a specification. It's those who hear these sermons have to be intentional about doing something with them. How can we take all of these elements and then use them for the glory of God? Because really, that's the bottom line. That's what we're all called to do. Take a look at 1 Corinthians. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, I'm up here and I'm throwing out ideas that will glorify God and empower the, the church. Now, how those ideas can be instituted and made relevant for God's people, well, that's up to you. You and the Holy Spirit, that is. But here's what it's going to take. It's going to take discernment and then action. It will take some of us getting up out of our spiritual recliners and becoming engaged which also means moving on from the present, which rarely is found at the top of our to-do list, isn't it? Moving on, changing. The majority of people embrace the present or the status quo. We look unfavorably at change in our lives. Now, these spiritual recliners that many of us have settled into in our lives, they can get really comfy, can't they? Really. You know, Reed, I, I like it where I'm at. Snug, secure, I know what I'm doing from day to day. God is good right here. It's restful, and I know God wants me to be restful. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to experience restful. We should all desire that, but God's restful doesn't really mean inactive. Look. Here's Moses conversing with God, and this is where God is telling him that he wants him to lead an entire nation through the desert into the promised land. Here's, here's what God said in Exodus 33. The Lord replied to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, obviously, Jehovah God wasn't meaning for Moses to back off from this leadership responsibility that he was calling him to. Not at all. Here's rest in Hebrew. It's nuach, and it means to draw breath. 
Here's what God was saying. Moses, take a deep breath. You got this because I've got you. Now, Jesus spoke about this rest for his people as well. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest in the Greek, anapao, and it means to refresh. Jesus was saying, as you live your lives for your heavenly Father, it will get burdensome. It's going to get challenging. And when it does, come to me, and I will refresh you. So neither translation, Old Testament, New Testament, Hebrew, or Greek, neither indicates this rest is resting on your laurels, just being satisfied. God's rest has nothing to do with being spiritually satisfied where one is at presently. How many of you know that the word comfy is not found anywhere in Scripture when it comes to talking about a born-again believer, how they are to live out their days and lives on this planet as a child of God. I like to think that, you know, when we get too comfy, one of the functions of God's Holy Spirit is, is to do this right here. This is the Holy Spirit recliner. Now, the moment we start settling in, wanting to put up our spiritual feet and grab that Sunday morning remote in our hands, I pray God's Spirit just boots us out. It gets us moving. You know, as a matter of fact, getting too comfortable tends to cause us to become spiritually careless and lazy. Listen, how many of you know we have to stay vigilant as the children of God? Because let me tell you, the moment that we begin laying off the gas from reading, studying, praying, worshiping, and fellowshipping, you could take it to the bank that the enemy is going to use your idleness to gain access to your life with the ultimate goal of rendering your life spiritually powerless. That's the point of these spiritual elements that I'm preaching about. When we are active in prayer, spending time in worship, when we're teaching and hearing the Word of God and being blessed by God's amazing grace, when we actively seek fellowship, with one another, when we serve God together, when we're being generous with all that God has given us, and when the men of God step up and into the roles in the body of Christ that God has called them to, when each one of us are sharing the testimonies of God's goodness in our lives, trust me, our lives will be anything but idle. And believe it or not, when we are pursuing all of these things for our lives and for the life of the church, we will also be experiencing God's rest. We'll be able to draw breath. We'll be able to become refreshed. Today's sermon, which is element number 10, also has the power to raise the level of vitality when the people of God are committed to developing it. I'm not going to announce it. Instead, I'm, I'm going to see if you can guess what it is by this next scripture. This is Jesus praying to his Father for us. Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they, they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You get it? Unity. Unity in the Greek, and not tes, and it means a oneness. It means a unanimity. Unity, agreement, harmony. It's God's desire that everyone in the body of Christ, all of us, have a total unanimity together, represented by who he is in our lives. And the last verse of what Jesus said in that prayer tells us why, tells us why we're supposed to be so united as one, so that all will know, everyone, that God sent his son as a love offering to the world. See, they could tell that, how unified we are. You know, when a man and woman are joined together under God's 
holy covenant of marriage. The Bible says that they become one flesh. Now, meaning one person. A husband and wife should be on the same page, so to speak, regarding their ambitions and their objectives for their family. The true desires of their hearts should mirror each other's. Their thinking and their actions should reflect a sense of selflessness and oneness. They should exhibit an unconditional love, one for the other. Together, their desire is in the relationship to glorify God in every respect. Now, I'm not saying they have to be clones of one another, but their ultimate goals for their relationship should be one and the same. That's not unlike the unity that God's spirit develops in the body of Christ. When we listen and we obey as the children of God, God's spirit will bring us together in unity under the headship of Christ. Our relationship with each other should reflect in many ways the relationship of a husband and a wife. For we are all called to, in Ephesians, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit, meaning to voluntary, voluntarily yield to. And there's one thing that I have found that keeps the children of God from voluntarily yielding to one another, whether it's in marriage or whether it's in the church, and that one thing is pride. The Bible lists the word pride 67 times, often with God adding things like this to it. I abhor pride. I will shatter his pride. I will put an end to their pride. Stubborn pride, the pride of the godless. I hate pride. Can't find too many instances where God is affirming pride in Scripture. Pride is the one thing more than any other that will drive a spiritual wedge between us and our Heavenly Father. And when we aren't living intimately with our Heavenly Father, guess what? It's going to be impossible to live intimately and in unity with one another as well. The Bible refers to us as brothers and sisters. You know why? It's because God is our spiritual father. We are one family. First Peter, Peter writes, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Now, the word fear means to treat with reverential obedience. See, when we're reverently obeying our father, it means we're loving his entire family. Okay, my brothers and sisters, just how do we get to be a child in God's family? Well, Romans tells us, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. There is one thing that enables us to become brothers and sisters and also brings us together in unity as one family. That's God's Holy Spirit. Jesus explaining, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Hmm. We're not orphans, meaning we are not fatherless. We have a father, all of us, the same father. And since we have the same father, that makes us all brothers and sisters. You see, God's Holy Spirit is just that. It is God's holy and righteous and powerful spirit. It's the spirit of Christ. And just where does he dwell? Well, Corinthians tells us. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? So it's important here now, I think, to understand that the unity I'm talking about exists only one place. In the body of Christ. The church. The kingdom of God. Which is comprised of the worldwide collection of people who are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I'm not talking about any other unifying right, relationship like the unity we have as Americans or as human beings in the world or political party unity, none of those things. You know, spiritually speaking, there have been two kingdoms functioning simultaneously on this planet at any given time, two, and only two. They are the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. They're opposite kingdoms. They are ruled by opposite leaders who are adversaries of one another. Knowing that, now, here's a must for us to understand. The kingdoms are not equal in power because the leaders of those two kingdoms are not equal in power. The devil, who is the leader of the kingdom of the world, only operates at the consent and permission of God. There's no balance of power that exists between these two kingdoms. It's important to understand that. He who is in me is what? Yeah, greater. There are qualifications for memberships in these two kingdoms as well. And they are also opposite. As a matter of fact, what qualifies for membership in one disqualifies for membership in the other one. The qualification for membership in the kingdom of the world? Sin. The qualification for membership in the kingdom of God, the absence of sin, we know it as righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ. Those who are sinless, who have been made righteous, are referred to as believers. Membership in this kingdom cannot be determined by merely claiming to be a believer. Membership in the kingdom of God is determined by one thing. One thing only. It is a blood test. Take a look. Ephesians 1, 7. In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. If the blood of Jesus has cleansed you of your sin through personal confession and repentance and an indwelling of God's spirit, you are a member of the kingdom of God. Now, this is done on a one-by-one -one personal basis. Right, Mike? Now, people who attend the same church, for example, aren't necessarily members of the same kingdom. People living under the same roof, husbands and wives, children and parents, brothers and sisters, many of them sadly exist in different kingdoms. Now, this message is going to make very little sense to those who are members of the kingdom of the world. As a matter of fact, they'll probably get offended and undoubtedly a little defensive hearing this. But understand, the qualifications for membership in these two kingdoms, they're not mine. They're not from the Church of the Rock or any other person. They come solely from the Word of God. Romans 5.19. Or just as through the disobedience of the one man, meaning Adam the fall, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus the Christ, many will be made righteous. Righteous in the Greek is dikaios, and it means innocent, it means faultless, it means guiltless, and it means sinless. First John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness, sinless. Now, it's important to understand that as members of God's righteous kingdom, we aren't to get ourselves all mixed up with what's going on in the other kingdom, the kingdom of the world. James 4, 4. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So, what is this world that we're not to be friends with? Well, world in the Greek is cosmos. And it's not a place, okay? It's a system. A worldly and demonic system. And here's what it does. It stirs fleshly desire. It's anything that seduces us away from God. And it serves as obstacles to the cause of Christ. Now, I've said this probably 
no less than 50 times from this pulpit. People are not the enemy of God. Even people dwelling in the kingdom of the world, they're not adversaries of God. Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. James warns us that flirting with the things which represent the kingdom of the world, those are sinful things, can easily develop into a habit or a pattern for us and cause our, our, our lives to be lived in opposition to God. No, people are not the enemy. However, people in the kingdom of the world can and will encourage you to do as they do and to live as they live. We can have relationships with those people in the other kingdom. Jesus modeled that, right? He encourages us to do that. But Jesus never advocated or he never blessed their behavior. And he expects us to do as he has done. Word of wisdom. The more time you spend in the presence of worldly kingdom people, the more difficult it is to live as kingdom of God people. See, as long as we're, we're a flesh, we will be enticed and we will be tempted to live by this worldly system. Now, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that unifies us as the people of God, but let's take a look at the ways in which he does that. Ephesians 4 Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, there's a couple of things to learn here. One, it takes effort to remain unified. The Spirit of God unifies us, but he does not force us to live in unity with one another. Keep in mind that our sinlessness is through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, period. Our sinlessness does not come through effort or behavior. Can I get an amen on that? If behavior was the basis for sinlessness, heaven would be the loneliest place in the universe. With that said, we must constantly pursue Christ. Following Jesus is not a walk in the park. It is difficult. We may be righteous in the eyes of God, which we are, but to live righteously, that takes effort. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. How difficult, this is rhetorical because every one of you would have an answer, how difficult is it to deny yourself? <laughs> Man. You know, it's extraordinarily difficult and challenging with the power of God's Spirit. Without it, it is impossible. Now, our unity with one another comes through the bond of peace that, that was spoken about just a minute, minute ago. That's made possible by Jesus. You see, his death eliminated the enmity that has existed between, between man and God since the fall. Jesus' death tore the veil, didn't it? It tore the temple shroud in two, bringing man and God back into a peaceful relationship once again, where it was before the fall, before sin. Because Christ is our Savior, God is our Father, and we are his sons and daughters. And that unity comes from being his children, members of the same family. John 1, 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Don't rush through that, what John is telling us right here. Once we receive Jesus as Savior and we believe in his authority, God gave us the right to become one of his children. Try to fathom that. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, the creator of the universe, says you are his child. Mm. Now, so as children of the same family, 
How are we supposed to treat one another? Well, Scripture gives us a slew of ways to do that. Romans 12.10. Be devoted to one another in brother, brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Honor, meaning value them. Esteem them. Nothing will endear or unite yourself to others like when you value them and when you esteem them. They will be drawn to you. See, value is how we see others. Esteem is how we treat others. When we begin to see our brothers and sisters in Christ, how our Father sees them, esteeming them will come naturally. You won't even have to work at it. Well, it'll come supernaturally. All right, how else? Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is one scripture I just as soon tear right out of the Bible. Not because it's not perfect, but because I'm not perfect. Forgiving others, whew, that's hard. I mean, it'd be a lot easier, right, if they came crawling, begging, pleading to be forgiven. But that's not the prerequisite here, is it? No. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Wow. That makes a huge difference. Listen, you want to restore unity with a brother or sister, either forgive them unconditionally or ask to be forgiven unconditionally, especially when they don't deserve it. Because you know what? I'm the first one to say I do not deserve the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, even this much. Forgive as you. John 13, 14. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Another powerful action that unifies us. But it does take the power of God to carry this out. If God would leave it up to me to pick the feet of the people I want to wash, would that be a whole lot easier? Yeah. But that's, that's not what he's saying. I mean, how did he feel washing Peter's feet, knowing that just hours away from him denying him three times? Well, and then, don't forget, he washed the feet of Judas. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. How, how often do you find yourself doing that? Building up someone else in the body of Christ. How many times a day do you encourage someone in the body? Speak into them life. And it really, that's what encouraging is. Solomon wrote this, The tongue has the power of life and death. You get to determine which one you're speaking. It's amazing what a word of encouragement will do to draw someone else closer to you. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. That man is mankind, as you well know. Confess your sins to each other. We can do that, you know, in the body of Christ. Why? Well, because a true brother or sister can be trusted. So we can do that. And we should do that, Scripture tells us. And praying for one another. Wow. Oh, I have to pray with them. No, man. You have the opportunity. You have the blessing to pray with them. Praying for one another is one of the most unifying and powerful things that we get to do as the people of God. And it also has effective healing qualities. When I pray with someone, you know what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of sharing the throne room of God with that person. We've entered in together into God's holy presence. What a beautiful and what a unifying experience that is. Going with my brother or with my sister 
and pleading our cause before him, before Yahweh, before the creator. We're, we get to do that. Oh, are you kidding me? What a privilege. Try to get that visual next time that you're praying. Especially if you're praying with someone in the body that you're going together. We're doing this together. We're going in to see our God together. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You want to experience God's grace in your life? Then begin to live humbly. Humility, simply put, is a lowering of yourself in an effort to elevate other people. You know, we want to be up here, this high, so to speak. But God says, if you want to be lifted, then lower yourself. It's the opposite of what the world tells us. But that's God's kingdom, right? Without Christ, humility is almost non-existent. But he lends us the power. Listen, when we lower ourselves, it is in submission, really, to the Lord. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of what? Out of reverence for Christ. We're doing it for our Lord. And when you're doing it for him, it's a whole lot easier than doing it for someone else. That's what makes it possible. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. You know, no divisions. This is a military reference. It reminds us that our strength, our power, our greatest chance for victory is locking arms and moving as one. One in battle. This agreeing with one another in the church, listen, it doesn't have anything to do with choice of worship songs or how we dedicate babies or communion or any of that. It has to do with the word of God. And it has to do with the salvation of our souls. We are to agree that God's word is eternal, it's powerful, it's truth, and it's inerrant. And it also means that the salvation of our souls come. Well, I'll let Peter tell you, Acts 4.12. Jesus is the cornerstone. That means the first one to be put up. That everything else is built around that because it's plumb. Jesus is the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Can we agree on that? If we can agree on that, you know what? Everything else is like way less important. 1 John 3.11. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. That love is agapao. That kind of love. We are to love one another. We are not to tolerate one another. Mm -mm. We are not to try to get along with one another. We are to love one another. And when we follow the word, when we submit to him, when we lower and humble ourselves as to the Lord, we will love one another. Matthew 5, 46, if you love those who loved you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Now, let me get real just for a moment as I, as I wrap up. There are some people in the kingdom of God, how can I say this, that are more difficult to love than others. Obviously, present company is excluded. You may know one or two. There are times I'm sure I'm harder to love than others. Okay. <laughs> she got it. She, find, she was, oh. <laughs> That's, I am. I, I gotta do. Scripture keeps reminding us that we're a family. We're a community. We're a community of like-minded people, God's people, his holy people, his righteous people. 
We have become brothers and sisters through an adoption. God's adoption as sons and daughters. He says this, and I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What an inconceivable and miraculous thing for God to do, huh? He didn't have to do that. All he asks of us is to live like brothers and sisters in return. Now, 2 Corinthians 13, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Holy Spirit of God joining us together as one family. What an incredible blessing. We are all joined together. And in the center of us all is God. God's Holy Spirit. Hmm. You know, when you hear these things from God's word, doesn't it have a way of, well, it has a way of convicting us, obviously, but doesn't it have a way of making things that you once thought were so important a whole lot less important? And that's what he's saying. Is Jesus your Savior? Is God your Father? Are you one in the blood of Christ? If so, you know what? It really doesn't matter after that. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the unity that exists between the family of God. I thank you for these brothers and sisters of mine. Lord, some I don't know their name, but Lord, I love them anyway because they are yours and they are my brother or my sister, and we are called to love them. Father, I, I pray for, for your word to just interact with our spirit and our attitude that as we go out each day, Father God, that we just embrace through the words that we say, through the way that we act, the things that we do, that we treat one another as you have called us to treat one another. And the reason so, so that the world may know, Jesus said, that you have sent me to them. Ultimately, that's the reason, Father, that the world may know, the lost may be found, the dead may come alive. So we thank you, Lord, and bless your name, now and forevermore. Amen. amen. And amen. Would you stand with me as we close our